you're watching news feed am well let's uh, as we count down now to the start of the second day of the final day of south africa's genocide case against the uh, at the international court of justice today israel gets to have its turn to defend itself against south africa's arguments that its military operations in gaza amounts to genocide now we could uh, possibly get the analysis of what might come from Israel and to help us understand or anticipate this, we are joined by a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria, Dr. Faranaz Viriava, and we are also joined by international relations professor at Wits University, Professor Gilbert uh, Kadiagala, to both of you, thank you very much for your time. Can I begin with you, Dr. Veriava, and ask whether you see anything, um, is there something to be said about Israel not having shown its legal strategy thus far? What do I mean by this? We don't know what their responding papers are going to say, what does that tell us about perhaps their preparedness for this case? Thank you. First, let me say thank you for having me on the show. And secondly, um, this has been a really proud moment as a South African and as a human rights lawyer um, to see us um, put forward the kinds of argument that were put forward by our government and by our legal team yesterday. They were faultless. Yes, I am not sure what to make of um, the failure to give us papers. Um, it is a normal common courtesy um, as a lawyer um, to share your papers with the opposition team so that they know what to uh, expect. Um, and we didn't get this. It's also interesting because in this kind of procedure, my understanding is there isn't a right of reply that you would have in a normal domestic court. Yeah. Um, so it was very much left to our team yesterday to preempt the arguments that would most likely be made by um, the state of Israel. And they did this in a few ways. First, they made it very clear that the, our arguments weren't going to be about blood and gore and that they were going to respect the people of Palestine. So when we saw pictures and evidence being presented, they were as far as possible uh, with the recognition of the dignity of the Palestinian people. Um, I don't know if the same will, be, will happen today. The other thing is that the final um, uh, 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 council yesterday that uh, acted on behalf of the South African team, who was Professor Vaughan Lowe, um, who spoke about provisional measures yeah. um, that we would want in this case. He then, in the last few minutes of the case, preempted what could be anticipated for today. And the one is in relation to an argument that we have targeted the state of Israel, but not Hamas. And his argument there was, well, the Genocide Convention is only, uh, can only be brought by state parties against state parties. Mm -hmm. And Hamas is not a state party. There will be other recourse that could be had against Hamas. Um, by the ICC, for example, prosecuting them for crimes against humanity. Then they also dealt with the issue of the right um, of Israel to defend itself. And two arguments were made, were made there. Most importantly, that nothing justifies a genocide. And what we are seeing is a genocide. So even though there may be crimes of humanity having been committed by Hamas, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't justify crimes against of humanity against the Palestinian people. Secondly, that um, the UN has noted over and over that, this, as, um, Pal that Gaza is under a state of occupation, and as such, um, you cannot say Israel has a right to defend itself. And that's been um, held in various advisory opinions of uh, the United Nations as well.
So that's the way in which it was preempted. But like I said, it's a discourtesy not to share your arguments in advance. <laughs> it's very interesting indeed. Let's come to you, Professor Kadia Gala, and I want to let on part of what Dr. Veriava has had to say, and that is that in that court, as she understands it, the procedure is that the party that has made the case, or the applicants, if you like, South Africa, there is not going to be a chance of reply nor, to my understanding, is there going to be a chance for an appeal. And therefore, you better make your case as strong as you possibly can. And therefore, it is going to be up to the court to decide by a vote of majority as to which side this case is going to go. So let's go into the merits, therefore. On the strength of um, the Genocidal Act, those submissions by South Africa, and this specifically deals with bodily and mental harm, do you think that South African lawyers did their best to put a strong case forward? And in your view, how did they do that? You know, I think the broader strategy of the South African team was to stick to the text. And by text, I mean the the Genocide Convention. So all the arguments uh, that they brought, whether it's a question of uh, bodily harm, the question of reproductive violence and so on, all these were arguments that stemmed very clearly from the Genocide Convention and the Articles. Hmm. And they wanted to stay to that text uh, because that is the case. The case is that uh, South Africa thinks that, in fact, that convention has been contravened by Israel by the very acts that it has performed since October uh, last year. So the, the arguments are very much uh, to the text, and they, they, they are very clear, uh, clearly laid out in the, in the petition by South Africa because when the argument is that um, when Israel responds, it has to respond specifically to the arguments around whether you're talking about bodily harm, whether you're talking about reproductive violence, uh, the destruction of infrastructure and so on, the killing of children, the dehumanization of the Palestinians, all these are uh, arguments that they are put across yeah. and not wanting to, to stray from the very text uh, of the Geneva, sorry, of, of the Genocide Convention. So I think that's how they, they essentially crafted that argument, uh, that we don't want to veer from the legal text and let's get all these arguments out. Yeah. But the other component of the legal text is a question of intent. Was there a genocidal intent? Doctor, and it was very... Prof Professor, I'm going to, I want to deal with this in a systematic way. So let, let's pause there for a moment because we're going to deal with the, the uh, genocidal intent, that presentation made by Advocate uh, Ngai Tobi. I want to stick with um, the genocidal act, uh, and that was put forward uh, by Advocate Adila Hassan. Let, let me come back to you, uh, Dr. Veriava, still on the question of genocidal act. The analysis yesterday was made that much of what she did was to quote UN agencies, and they were quoted at length about what they said was going on in Gaza, uh, whether you talk about uh, the first responders or the effort to bring in aid. And someone said that was quite clever because the ICJ operates under the United Nations, and therefore, if you are going to quote UN agencies, you're basically tying the court to not veer because this essentially is their, these, these agencies are, are basically their institutions, and, their, and therefore, whatever it is that they have said, surely will be taken as gospel. Do you think that that was a, a good strategy? I think the whole thing was a very well-planned strategy, and Adila, 
um, very succinctly and coherently presented the evidence. Um, what would normally happen in a broader case of genocide, so this is, this is still an interim case for interim measures, and obviously uh, it was hard to get uh, evidence of broad emission reports uh, from the UN, which was what, what in the ordinary, ordinary course could be relied on. What we had to rely on, South Africa, in this case, were the kind of evidence that people are getting on the ground, UN people, uh, World um, Health Organization people who are on the ground and are giving evidence um, or sending out uh, evidence of what is happening. Interestingly, one of the things that we are asking for in our provisional measures is the preservation of evidence for the longer tech case where we will determine the case more with more finality and which will take many more years. So for example, you know, when you look, we have, one of the things we've said is a lot of dumb bombs have been dropped. Yeah. So proof of what kind of bombs were dropped. Um, but yes, we relied on UN evidence because that is the most credible evidence. Obviously, is the, Israel has gone on the attack against the UN even, um, has even gone directly for um, uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN. So I think whatever evidence we are going to put forward, they will check the credibility or try and undermine the credibility. But obviously we are sitting with uh, 15 uh, normal, you know, permanent judges and two ad hoc judges, one of them being our own, very own DJP, Moseneki. Yeah. And um, they take an oath and they will look at that evidence and assess their credibility um, and attach whatever weight they want to it. Let's then come to the question of um, genocidal intent, uh, Professor Kadiakala. And this is the, the element you were uh, going into a little earlier. And my question to you is framed very simply again. Advocate Mugai Tobi relied heavily on what was said by the political leadership, in other words, government officials in Israel. And this, he said, was his way of demonstrating the de dehumanization element of the Palestinian people and that that kind of rhetoric from government would have translated into the ground by the manner in which the soldiers acted in carrying out uh, these atrocities, as South Africa put it. Do you think that that was, again, a good strategy by South Africa? Yeah, it was, I think, a powerful strategy because intent is important. Uh, I think particularly when you come to genocide, you have to put it at that very high level. Was it what this act intended? And the only way I think to demonstrate, uh, which is what the South African legal team was saying, is to look at the public record, uh, the statements from the top leadership, because this is important. They, they lead the process. They lead the war. And what they say is important. It translates on the ground. As you say, the, mil the military is going to take orders from uh, the prime minister or the minister of defense. Mm. So they have to document what this leadership, in fact, has been saying publicly. And these are matters of the public record. They're in the public domain. Yeah. Uh, so the intent is also demonstrated very clearly, therefore, in the statements that we had from the leadership, uh, and uh, it's a very strong case, therefore, that there's no, uh, there's no doubt uh, that these statements were intended, in fact, to cause the kinds of harm that uh, South Africa is describing as genocide.